welcome those who are, who are with us today. And it is good that you have joined us in the house of the Lord today here at First Baptist Church Woodlawn. We are glad you're here. You are here. We hope that you are well and invite you to enjoy our service. We've had a wonderful time of worship already, getting ready to enter into a time of, of presenting the word and hearing from the Lord. And But uh, first, we have Miss Melanie who's going to come and share with the kids. So you all may be seated here. Welcome again. We're glad you're here. Kids, come on up. Is this everybody? Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Good, good, good. What about that snow out there this morning? That was pretty, wasn't it? A little bit? Okay. What do I have here this morning? What is that? Sheep. I'm going to give each of you a sheep. I should have ten little sheep. Okay. There's one, two, three, let's see. There's four. Nine? I only have nine little sheep? Wait, wait, I'm supposed to have ten little sheep. One of them ran away? What am I going to do? I lost a sheep? You see it? You see my sheep? Over there's my sheep? <laughs> oh my goodness! Jamie, would you go get my sheep for me? <laughs> it's a stubborn little sheep. Okay, thank you. Now I have all ten of my sheep. We can rejoice. We can say yay, right? Let's rejoice. Yay! yay. <laughs> okay, so God used sheep to tell a story. It's called a parable. He told this to his disciples that the shepherd, now who can be the shepherd in the Bible? God. God is our shepherd, okay? And he takes care of us, just like we are the sheep, okay? But if one of us strays away, if one of us gets lost, he gets all upset, just like I got lo got upset about my missing sheep. And he gets really, really happy. Everybody rejoices, and he throws a really big party when one of those lost sheep comes back, okay? In Matthew chapter 18 verses 12 through 13 it says what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray and if he finds it truly I say to you he rejoices over it more than over the 99 then that went that never went astray so he rejoices because he found his lost sheep okay so remember Jesus is our shepherd and anytime we stray away he's gonna come and find us okay all right I know there's no children's church this morning so if each of you want to get a color sheet about the shepherd and his sheep and a bag of colors and take those back to your seats with your parents all I ask is that when you're when you leave today put the colors back in this white basket that's on the back table okay all right so you guys can come up and get a color sheet and bag of colors you can keep your sheet <laughs> we're generous like that around here <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. I'm so thankful for, for you and the kids. Uh, today's Melanie's birthday, by the way. Happy birthday to Melanie. <laughs> and I know she's so happy that I said that. <laughs> How good it is to be in the presence of God that each of us would be here and to hear the word of the Lord and to apply the word of the Lord. And that, and that is, is the key to not only hear the word of God, but then to also heed and to ap apply the word of the Lord. And 
Uh, today I'm going to preach on, on revival and ask the question, what is revival? And the, the word can be kind of a, a, a broad term when people hear the word revival. Many people think of a, of a week's worth of, of services. You know, we're going to go to the revival. Um, but that's, that's not what, what Scripture talks about when I mean talks about revival or, or renewal. Uh, revival services can be wonderful Uh, they are for the church they are for uh, believers who would be uh, renewed and who would experience the presence of God the forgiveness of God in a a powerful way and that's that's the goal that's the idea of of revival renewal is that we would experience God and so there are other questions that revolve around that where does it begin when does it begin in whom does revival come and how do we prepare for it and the very first response that I would give you today is that revival is a work of God period It is something that he uh, initiates. There is nothing that you and I can do to earn a powerful move of God, neither uh, personally nor collectively. It would come, it will come, it does come unexpectedly. It comes at a time you didn't plan, and it comes in a manner in which you didn't plan. It's not about you and me. Revival is 100% about God, about his glory and his sovereignty, and it's about his great love that he has for you and me. And there are many great stories of the accounts of revival down through the years all around the world. And in reading the accounts when the Holy Spirit did, did a, a, a shaking, because generally when you hear of these works of God in these places around the world, a lot of times it'll happen in a little bitty dot on the map. It doesn't have to happen in the epicenter of a country or the universe. Sometimes it's just, it's little happenings that happen like in, in, in Woodlawn or in little places that God just decides that he's going to do a work. And when he does a work, it's a, it's a, a shaking, it's a, a renewal. And you might even be faced with the question, do I, do we really want revival? And Brian, why would you even ask that? Of course we want revival. But I would submit to you at the very beginning of this message today that revival can be messy. Revival can and usually is, maybe always, is very inconvenient. A prerequisite to revival is that people get right with God. There are those who think that if we come together and if we pray for revival, then people will get right. But actually, revival comes as the result of people getting right with God. So we're going to turn things kind of on its head a little bit this morning. Sometimes... Dealing with sin in our life, sometimes generational sins that are dealt with by the Holy Spirit can be messy. They can be messy in our lives. Coming to grips with the things in our life that we know are not pleasing to God, messy but glorious. Seeing people set free is glorious. Revival will most likely mess with your calendar. Revival will interrupt your TV time. It will affect your social media activity, and it will affect everyone around you. 
and I might get a little fired up preaching about it. <laughs> because I want it. But more importantly, I need it. And you may or may not want revival or see a need for it, but you need it too. And as I read through several of the historical accounts of Holy Spirit revival, there's one prayer that I need to discontinue. There's a prayer that we need to stop praying. We need to stop praying for revival. Wow. Wait, what? Stop praying for revival. What about asking you shall receive, Pastor? What about knock and the door will be open to you? When Jesus told his disciples, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it for you. So shouldn't we ask God for revival? No. So, I guess you want to know why. Because we need to take care of business with God. We need to read and pray over and over and over again our text this morning, which I didn't even read, Psalm 139. Let's go to that, guys. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any grievous ways in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need to go to that scripture every day, all the time. Read it over and over again. Pray it over and over again. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous ways, wicked ways, hurtful ways, offensive ways in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's where it starts. The Amplified Version says, Search me thoroughly, O God. I don't need to be praying for something for which I'm not yet ready. So often we want to put the cart before the horse. And for praying for revival, that's exactly what we're doing. We're asking God to do something that, that there's got to be other things in place first. So here I go with another sports analogy. If you by chance would hear me pray this prayer, oh Lord, let the cardinals call me. I need to be in the major leagues and I need to be in that starting rotation. Lord, I need that call. Let me have that call, Lord. First of all, you'd be, huh, Brian, you're on crack. <laughs> uh, what, what makes you think that you're at all ready or able to play major league baseball, minor league baseball, high school baseball, pony league baseball? What makes you think that you're ready or able to do any of that. But it's what I want. Well, if it's what I want, then I need to stop talking about it, and I need to start putting in the work that will open the door for that opportunity. So if I'm consistent in praying for revival in my life, but there's no change that's reflected in my life through repentance, praying for it is meaningless. It's out of, it's out of alignment. It's putting the cart before the horse. So Lord, forgive me for praying for revival when I'm not ready for it. The prayer for revival will come from a place in me that is broken 
and sin is being dealt with. And I'm experiencing deep sorrow because I've grieved God in selfishness and pride. And I'll be honest with you, if that's okay. I'm not broken. I'm not broken. I pray for forgiveness of sin, but I'm not broken. I'm not really torn up over it yet. Are you? You torn up over your sin? You lay on your face, cry out to God because you grieved him in your sin? Probably not. And so I pray. Search me, O God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me. Try my my thoughts. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, any grievous way, any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I encourage you to wear out a path to Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 every day. Wear out a path. Pray it. Cry out to God to convict you of the offenses in your life toward him. Every hidden dark corner. Every nook and cranny. every place that you've kept hidden from God and from others. Allow repentance to get messy in your life. First John 1 John 1.9 is one of the great promises of Scripture. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all our sins and from all unrighteousness. He is faithful. You're in good hands. Your life is in good hands. You're in the best hands. God smiles upon true repentance. Don't you love it when your your kids or your grandkids own up to something they did stupid? You know they did it. Don't you love it when they just come clean? It makes you happy. The revival that started it all is is the template for Holy Spirit-controlled renewal that launched the church, Pentecost. And before Pentecost, the the disciples were were ragtag. They were a bit dysfunctional. And before his ascension, Jesus assured them that his going away would be the best for them. It would be best that he go away. So that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, would come after him. So what did he do? He instructed them to return to Jerusalem and wait for the promised Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us there were about 120 who gathered together in the upper room. So they got to the upper room. Did the Holy Spirit come right away? No. He told them to wait, right? He said, wait. He didn't say how long you're going to wait, but he said, just go and wait. And we can surmise by, by events in Scripture that there was a period of about seven to ten days during which they waited together trusting that Jesus knew what he was talking about. So what do you think happened during those seven to ten days of being together in one place? Hopefully there was a shower. I doubt it. Acts 
Acts 1.14 says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Praying together in a room for at least a week. So, again, I would submit to you this morning that there were prayers of repentance. I would also tell you, and I believe, that relationship issues were resolved. God's people were getting right. God's people were getting right with him, and they were getting right with each other. And here's how Acts chapter 2 begins. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. The King James Version says they were in one accord in one place. And the Amplified Version says they were all assembled together in one place. Meaning that God waited until their hearts and their minds were right. He waited until, until they dealt with the sin in their own heart. They stopped pointing fingers at one another. And they dealt with what was in their own heart until relationships were mended and they were in one accord. They were in one mind. They were in unity. And verse 2, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And according to Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 41, I'm not going to read them, but just that you know, five verses there, 37 through 41. After hearing Peter preach that first sermon, Scripture records that over 3,000 were saved and baptized on that first day. And Scripture says that awe came upon everyone because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, we, we are a direct result of what happened in Jerusalem in the upper room that day. Time and time again, from the Reformation in the 1500s to the Great Awakenings of the 1700s, Azusa Street in Los Angeles in the early 1900s, the World War II revival in 1935, the Baby Boomer Jesus Movement, woohoo, in the 60s and 70s, and many others before in between and after the Holy Spirit sees and he knows the heart of man and Psalm 135 verse 6 says whatever the Lord pleases he does that's important to know that folks that whatever the Lord pleases whatever pleases him he does he will do what pleases him, what gives him glory, and on those, on those whom he pleases, he pours himself out to experience his goodness and his power. That's where I want to be. I want to be, I want to be the recipient of his goodness and his power. Where lives are changed. Where churches are changed where pastors are changed, communities are changed, countries are changed, marriages are changed, schools are changed, the, the drunk gets sober, the liars stop lying, the cheaters stop cheating because they see and experience the overwhelming goodness of God and forgiveness of sin. And as Peter and John say in Acts 420. They were fired up after they experienced Pentecost, after they experienced what they experienced in the upper room. They were fired up. This is what Peter and John said. We can't help but speak of what we have seen and heard. Can't help it. Can't stop me. Can't help it. So, Will the next generation speak of the revival at Woodlawn? 
Because, you know, when a re revival happens, it's, it's years before you see the true impact. Will they speak of the revival at Woodlawn? Will they write about the husbands and wives who got right with God and transformed their family? Will they tell about church members who couldn't help but tell their neighbors and co-workers about the goodness of God and how he forgave sin upon sin in their life? Stories. Will stories be told of late night prayer gatherings at the altar and in the pews because they didn't want to leave without touching God? Will they, tear about, will they tell about poor people and less desirable people being loved unconditionally because they're created in the image of God? Or will things never really change? Sins will go unconfessed. Grudges will still be held against family members and friends. True repentance will be avoided. While we play games and get distracted from what matters more than anything. Because you know what? We're content to be going to heaven while we are miserable in our lives with unrepentant sin. Don't think you're alone. It's every one of us. I do want revival, but I'm going to stop praying for it. There's other things to take care of because you know what? When we're right with God, when I'm right with God, when you're right with God, when you've confessed your sin and when you are experiencing his, his power in, in humility, revival will just come. It will come. We need to take care of business with God because I want a revival When revival comes, it will make such an impact. You'll know it. You'll know it. You'll be calling people and telling people what's going on. It will make an impact. I want it to impact me. I want revival to impact my marriage. I want revival to impact my calling as, as a pastor. I want revival to impact my relationships. I want revival to impact the community of Woodlawn and this country, and I want it to impact you. And here's where it starts. Guys, put the scripture back on the screen. Here's where it starts. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray. Dear God, words do fail at this time. And I just ask, Lord, that that, that gut-level feeling that, that, that each of us is experiencing right now, Lord, that is the, the Holy Spirit at work in each one of us. It's a good thing. It's a powerful thing. Because, Lord, I'm, I'm feeling it in, in my gut right now. There's work to be done. There's... there's there's activity to be done in our lives to prepare for what we desire. There's not one of us 
who calls ourselves believers in Jesus, call ourselves Christians. I don't think there's any one of us in this place that, that doesn't want more of you. But Lord, we're, we're hindered. Sin, sin hinders. As a, as a dam blocks the, the water from, from flowing. Sin is the dam of the heart. It hinders the flow of the Holy Spirit. Sin hinders. But repentance, repentance is the dam breaker. Oh, Lord. There's not one single person who is singled out today, Lord. It's every one of us. Lord, let there be repentance. Let there be a a, a knowing in our lives, Lord, that we have sinned against you and against you alone. And whether we are aware of the sin or if there's sin we're not aware of, Lord, as Scripture says, search me. Search me. Know everything about me, Lord. And if there's anything grievous, hurtful, offensive, wicked. Lord, let me know it. Then I confess it. Oh, Lord, because I want you. I want what you want for me, Lord. And it starts with search me, O God. Search me, O God. Change me, O God. Change me. Change me. Stop pointing the finger at someone else. I'm pointing it back at myself. I'm going to be the one to say I'm sorry. Doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong. I'm going to say I'm sorry because there's there's a wall that needs to come down. Oh, Lord, have your way. And let it begin. Let it begin this morning with search me, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand, please, if you would. Let's see.